Great. Good evening and welcome again to the virtual John F. K. Jr. Forum. My name is Victor Flores and I'm the co-chair of the Fellows and Study Group Program. I'm a sophomore in Courier House from North Canaan, Connecticut, studying government, public policy, and ethnicity, migration, and rights. Each semester here at the IOP, we host a diverse cohort of fellows who teach and mentor, but also learn from students across the Harvard community. Normally, residential fellows live on campus and lead students in political discourse by way of their weekly study groups. However, this is not a regular semester. Despite the virtual environment, the IOP is privileged to welcome six fellows who will continue to engage and interact with students during this historic year. Amid a global pandemic, economic uncertainty, a racial injustice reckoning, and a transition of power, there is no shortage of topics to cover this semester. Our fellows will help students grapple with these issues, inspiring them to pursue a life of public service that engages with the very challenges we'll discuss throughout the next few months. Over the course of their appointment, fellows will continue traditional cornerstones of the fellowship virtually. The Institute will convene study groups led by fellows three times a week on pressing topics, including the future of conservatism, city leadership, sustaining voter engagement, and foreign policy in the post-COVID outbreak world. In addition, fellows will immerse themselves in the Harvard community by mentoring IOP student leaders, holding virtual office hours for all students, and leading co-curricular programming. As I enter my role as co-chair, I look back on my time in FSG with hope. The hope that others will be afforded the same opportunities, the hope that what I've learned will help me make tangible impacts in my community, and the hope that the friendships I have made with the fellows and students alike will last far beyond our shared time at Harvard. I encourage all Harvard students to apply to be part of the FSG team. It is the knowledge and friendships built here that will make the difference in instituting the change we want to see. A computer screen will not hinder FSG's thoughtful discourse and vibrant community. As long as there are political challenges to discuss and injustices to correct, the Fellows Program will stand to create a space for thoughtful discourse. With that said, I want to thank our fellows for bravely accepting the challenges of this semester and forging onward, knowing there is important work to be done. Our first fellow tonight, Janet Hook, is a national political reporter for the Los Angeles Times in the Washington Bureau. She has spent most of her career covering Congress and national politics, including the last three presidential campaigns and many modern midterm elections. Our next fellow, William Crystal, is a founding director of Defending Democracy Together, an educational and advocacy organization dedicated to defending America's liberal democratic norms principles, and institutions. Crystal has long been recognized as a leading analyst of American politics and has helped shape the national debate on issues ranging from American foreign policy to the meaning of American conservatism. Mr. Crystal served in senior positions in the Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations. Finally, we have Ensei Ufot, the Chief Executive Officer of the New Georgia Project and its affiliate, New Georgia Project Action Fund. NSA leads both organizations with a data-informed approach and a commitment to developing tools that leverage technology with the goal of making it easier for every voter to engage in every election. Last but not least, we are fortunate to have our conversation moderated tonight by the IOP's director, Mr. Mark Guerin. Prior to joining the IOP, he served as the president of Hobart and William Smith Colleges for 18 years. His public service has included posts in the Clinton administration as White House Deputy Chief of Staff, White House Communication Director, and Director of the Peace Corps. Thank you all for having me, and to our fellows, welcome to Harvard. Thank you very much, Victor, for that uh, generous introduction and for your thoughtful comments uh, about the Fellows Program, and welcome to everyone joined, students and community members, faculty and staff members. We are thrilled to have the first of two forums, uh, allowing our community to meet the extraordinary group of fellows, as Victor had said, who join us. Victor's hard work with his co-chair, Nadia Douglas, has allowed for these great individuals who bring their experience as a governor, a mayor, a democracy entrepreneur, a journalist, political uh, analyst, and a diplomat to Harvard Institute of Politics this semester. So we are grateful for that. And as Victor said, well, these are extraordinary times in American civic life. We believe we have six 
uh, quality folks to bring forth the kind of conversations and study groups, engagements in forums like this and elsewhere on campus. So we are excited for the conversation ahead, proud of this tradition that's been part of the Institute of Politics uh, since 1966 and excited to, to delve in with Ense and Janet and Bill, welcome. In many cases, Ense, you were just in the forum last semester, so welcome back to the forum. Thank you, thank you for having me again. You're right, right. And well, let me um, let me dial right in. We have some conversations for the first 20 minutes or so, and then we'd love to open it up to to questions from students and others that are gathered. Um, but perhaps, Ense, I could start with you. Um, Victor gave a great introduction of your important work as CEO, uh, the important effort that you led uh, for several years, integrating and leveraging technology and the use of data. So I guess to kind of frame and kind of build that out, what were some of the real takeaways that you have from the most recent, I guess, presidential election? And then of course, the two Senate runoffs in Georgia. Yeah. Um... A couple of takeaways. I think one is that um, this sort of multiracial democracy that we've been talking about uh, across the South, but in our country, it is not a thing of the future, that it is here. Um, and it is certainly here in Georgia. Uh, when, you know, just early returns, looking at the data, looking at the idea that, um, you know, 70% of white Georgians voted for former President Trump um, and he still lost in our state. And that one cycle ago, uh, that would have been unheard of. And so the idea is that a successful candidate in Georgia is going to have to pull a multiracial majority uh, in order to win. And that is again, something that we've been talking about for quite some time, that it is here. It's our reality now, one. I think two, the data tells us that um, it was rural Georgia that won uh, these elections that was the deciding factor and specifically black voters in rural Georgia. And so over the past couple of weeks and over the next couple of weeks, we are going to see journalists and um, political operatives literally contort themselves to try to center white voters and try to center Trump voters in the narrative about how Georgia was won. And it's gonna be uncomfortable to watch <laughs> um, and when the truth is much more simple and much more elegant, um, and again, it's that the multiracial, our multiracial democracy is here. Um, but they will say, you know, Trump was on the ballot, Trump wasn't on the ballot, et cetera, and we'll work overtime to try to center uh, him as a part of that narrative. Um, and so, and it, there's no data to support it. And I think lastly, uh, you know, a lot of conventional political wisdom about Black people and, like, uh, and who shows up in runoffs. Um, you know, there was so many, there was so much hand wringing about, well, you know, Republicans have a structural advantage uh, that, you know, you know that no one shows up for runoff elections. Um, and, you know, we have to, that uh, the, the runoffs are over Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, like the high holidays, Thanksgiving, um, and you're not going to be able to run a campaign the way that you normally would. Uh, so you should moderate your expectations. Um, and you know, the data shows that 80% uh, of the general election turnout, uh, the general election electorate um, showed up again to vote in the runoffs, which is unheard of, unprecedented, never happened before in Georgia history. So um, yeah, I think that uh, and this is gonna definitely sound self-serving, uh, but the other sort of thing that we, that emerged from the data is that we were right. Mm. But you had all of that in the pandemic, right? Yeah, and all of that in a pandemic and in a pandemic that has hit the communities that we were targeting for registration, for education and for mobilization, um, the hardest. Mm -hmm. I would also say that, so there's the pandemic uh, that created, that, that did, you know, 
many people who know us and know the work of the New Georgia Project know that we have registered over half a million young people and people of color just in the state of Georgia alone. Um, and that our key tactic is these sort of high quality face-to-face conversations that we train our organizers to have. And we did not have that tactic available to us because many people were you know, trying to not die. Um, and so it forced us to shift our tactics. It forced us to get very real about how we were going to have meaningful interactions and meaningful conversations that were mediated by our devices. Um, I would also say that it, we you mentioned the pandemic. There's also a summer of protest. Uh, that deeply impacted um, the young people that we are organizing and organizing with the communities of color uh, that we had prioritized during this cycle. And so there is the pandemic, there is the protest um, that we had to contend with. Uh, so training our organizers how to, you know, show up with their clipboards uh, and bottles of milk uh, to, <laughs> to deal with possible uh, tear gassing and pepper spray. So um, how to care for one another, how to look out for one another, um, but also that we want to meet our people where they are. And so you're holding up a sign that says defund the police. Do you know that uh, it's the mayor and city council persons that make decisions about the police budget? And so, okay, you have questions about the efficacy of voting. You are the most revolutionary activist to ever protest of all time. But if the, to bring about this policy change that you want to see, we have to elect people who are going to make budgetary decisions. So you should definitely register to vote with us today um, to make the sign, the slogan on your protest, uh, to give it a fighting chance uh, in the next city council budget hearings. Um, and so training our people to think on their feet uh, in the midst of what was chaos uh, in a lot of instances. Um, so, yeah. And then the disinformation. Uh, we all became, uh, you know, we all, digital media literacy uh, became a tactic that our entire staff uh, needed to adopt, right? Because of uh, how aggressively young voters and voters of color were targeted by bad actors, both foreign and domestic, uh, as it relates to misinformation online about COVID, about the elections, um, about a lot of very important matters. Really interesting, really. Well, let me bring Janet into this because it, it follows on for the information piece that we can get to as well. But Janet, let me bring you into this because you're going to in your study group, you want to look at the first hundred days of the Biden administration. And obviously there's been recent news with, and given your background, covering Congress, knowing national politics so well, with the 10 Republican senators going to the Oval Office, as you assess these first couple weeks, what are some of the uh, toll gates you're seeing here, the, the moments you're seeing as it's building this narrative for the first 100 days of the Biden administration? And where would you place that convening as, as they work out this COVID relief plan? Well, it kind of feels like the Biden has already had his first 100 days in the first two weeks. I mean, so much has happened. Um, part of it is a strategy that I think he has, he has pursued of just cramming a lot of action and executive orders and a sense of urgency um, it's in keeping with the way he campaigned, which was to say, you know, that the, the country's on fire with a pandemic and an economic crisis and, and urgent action is needed. Um, I think he also has tried very hard, as he did in the campaign, but since he's been sworn in to make it clear, he is not Donald Trump. He is making a 180 degree turn from the way Trump governed both in terms of policy and politics. Um, it's, it, his, his White House is as orderly and disciplined as Trump's was chaotic and backstabbing. Um, and so it, it, may, it makes sense given the, the, the context and his campaign message that his first order of business is this big COVID relief and economic recovery 
bill that he's introduced. And it really does bring into focus um, both the, the, the challenges that he faces governing with such a narrow majority in Congress. I mean, the House's majority is as close as it's ever been for the longest time. And the Senate is 50-50 with a tie broken only by Kamala Harris. So that he did not come to office with a big electoral mandate. It seems like the voters who voted him into office, the, the clearest message was, uh, let's get rid of Trump. So in essence, uh, Biden accomplished his first campaign promise the day he got sworn in. And so then it's the then what? Um, and it was, so in, in these weeks since he, God, has it only been two weeks? I, I, I've, I can't believe it. Um, he, uh, he's been exploring kind of where he can get support for this um, $1.9 trillion package that he's proposed in the Senate in particular. Um, so the, the, the situation in the Senate is if there's a filibuster, you, you need 60 votes to get around the procedural hur hurdle. So that's why 10 Republicans is the magic number that um, there are these Republicans who, who are saying that they are open to compromising and supporting some kind of COVID relief package, but much, much scaled back to what Biden is proposing. So it is a really big test of Biden's taste for bipartisanship on the one hand, with his promise of, of urge, uh, his, his focus on the urgent need for act, quick action. So do you move fast or do you wait around for, for Republicans to come around? And so far he's shown not a lot of interest in dawdling. Um, and part of that is um, sort of a, a lesson that he and the Obama administration learned uh, back in 2009, 2010, where they spent a lot of time trying to get Republican support for Obamacare, for the healthcare law, and uh, it was all for naught. Um, so anyway, so he did, he did bring those 10 Republicans who offered to support something much more scaled back. He did bring them to the Oval Office, to the White House, and it was the first in-person big Senate meeting he had. And so it was kind of was a good homage or at least a hat tip to his commitment to bipartisanship. Um, I would be very surprised if those 10 Republicans were brought along in, in what ends up coming for a vote in the Senate. And how about having uh, covered uh, so much of politics in the Hill and understanding the relations with the media? What's your assessment of the president's team and their press relations in these first weeks since the election inauguration through these first two weeks? Oh, well, that is, you know, exhibit one of their desire to say we are not like Donald Trump's White House. I mean, that they actually have a a press secretary who holds press briefings and takes questions and gives answers. I mean, um, I, I am getting tired about the uh, tired of the concept of returning to normalcy, but but it is kind of more like a normal press shop now. Um, they have they put out policies, they hold briefings, they put experts up to talk to reporters to make sure that they understand the policies. Um, I mean, there's a little bit of a honeymoon among reporters just because it's it's so different from the way Trump was treating reporters, just berating them all the time and casting doubt on the credibility of the entire institution of the press. Um, but, you know, there is still the, the natural skepticism and adversarial relationship between people in power and reporters that comes up uh, right. inevitably. Right. Um, we should get back to that question that Nse raised too about disinformation in social media and, and the reliance on this. But Bill, let me let me bring you in uh, to this and welcome back to the Kennedy School. You've uh, traveled journeys here um, as a graduate and, and having been at the Kennedy School and you wanting in your study group to look at uh, the future of the party, the Republican Party. And as Victor said, having served in the Reagan and Bush 41 administrations and been a thought leader in many ways in conservative, you know, conservative thought, but I guess my question is stepping back from the intrigue of party politics and for those of us who love politics and today's events with the Republican caucus and so forth, but just step back, why is it important for democracy? Why are parties important in, in whether the party shapes in one way or another or morphs or whatever? Why as citizens 
engage in this uh, democracy. Why do you feel that's important? Bill, you're gonna to wanna to unmute. You're gonna to wanna to unmute yourself first. It wouldn't be a Zoom call if someone didn't unmute themselves. It's the rule here. So. Yes. And you wanna still unmute yourself. Okay, is that there good? There you go. Perfect. It's embarrassing after a year of Zoom not to be able to <laughs> mute and unmute at the right time. We've all been there. Yeah, exactly, that's for sure. Um, Look, it's it's a very first of all, it's great to be back, and I wish I were back in 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 in, in real life, as we say. But uh, I'll come back in real life too at some point. I, I trust uh, to the, to the Kennedy School, to the IOP, and to Harvard. Um, I mean, social scientists have given this a lot of thought. But basically, modern democracies work through political parties. They work through different kinds of parties and different systems. But we don't. It's the way citizens can be organized to uh, generally reflect their points of view and their interests and have representatives who can work together. And so you don't have, you know, 435 people showing up somewhere without any bonds and any, uh, you know, everything has to be put together for every different vote and so forth. Um, at times people have worried the American political parties were too weak. That was the convention, conventional view 50, 60 years ago. Now people worry they're too strong in a sense and too polarized and too, there's too much partisanship, which could well be true. But we have had a two-party system for a long, long time. There are structural and historical reasons for that. It's not inevitable that it stays that way, but the presumption probably should be that it will uh, until, until we see a real change. Uh, and if you have two parties and you have a liberal constitutional democracy, it's healthier if both parties are committed to that liberal constitutional democracy, healthier if they're, I would say generally, there are times when you do want radical change, but generally healthier if they're able to work together on some issues, uh, don't view each other as enemies, but rather as opponents in politics, uh, are willing to work together on some things uh, and so forth. And that's generally, again, without overstating it and without, uh, you know, uh, too pretty a picture of the past, it's been the way it's been. It's one reason we've been a pretty successful country and made progress on a lot of issues, incidentally, uh, over 75, let's just say since World War II. Uh, and I do think that's, we are at a very unusual moment now Kind of an inflection point where from my point of view the republican party is a questionable uh, the future of it's questionable i mean i think if if, if it becomes a nativist authoritarian uh a party with more indulging more than parties usually do a kind of extremism and conspiracy theories and so forth uh you know it's a big party and maybe it'll lose elections for the next 20 years but maybe not and so it changes the character of our democracy if it doesn't accept peaceful transfers of power, to take the most obvious recent instance. I mean, that is something different. Whatever you might have thought of different presidents in the last 50, 60 years, none of them thought to challenge that. None of them thought to call mobs to the Capitol to, to uh, try to uh, intimidate people to act to prevent the peaceful transfer of power. None of them uh, peddled a big, they peddled some people, not always honest in politics, but none of them has peddled a big lie of the kind that President Trump and peddled and his, a lot of his supporters and a lot of other people acquiesced in. That's really been, that is, that's happens in other countries. And when it happens in other countries, we look at it and say, oof, that's a kind of unstable situation. And I hope democracy does well there. And how can we help them strengthen their democracy? And here we're suddenly the ones who might need help and strengthening, but the help's gonna have to come internally mostly. And, and therefore we need to uh, strengthen our own democratic institutions, our norms, uh, that's, there's a lot that can be done in both parties. There's a lot that can be done in reforming Congress and elections and voting and a lot of things, civil society and social media. But one thing is that, that has to be done, I think, is to try to have a healthy Republican party. And so that's something I've been involved in and involved in some of the struggles over. I'm not sure it'll, how quickly or if at all the party could be restored to health, but um, you know, it's a big question. So yeah, it's not just a question, I think, I'm gonna to try to stress this in the study group. It's not a, I mean, if you're a Republican or a conservative, maybe it's a little more urgent for you, a little more personal kind of a challenge, but from the, for the country as a whole, you know, it kind of matters what a party that 74 million people voted for this past November and has 50 senators and 211 or whatever it is, House members and half the governors, I mean, it sort of matters what the character of that party is. And if it's a party, that has 65% of its members of the House voting to overturn electors in cases where there's zero evidence that 
that should even be considered, honestly. Uh, and uh, you only can get 10 then members of that, of that say body to a vote for an impeachment for a president who I would argue is pretty clearly deserves it. Uh, you have a really unusual uh, and, and challenging situation. Let me go back and say to your point on misinformation and social media being sort of the new terrain of a lot of this. And, and from your work um, with both young voters and older voters who may not be as comfortable with technology, um, what should, what, again, what are some of the takeaways and what should Americans be looking at for the kind of um, information that is accurate and valuable? What, when you come through the experience you've had and you raise the point of this uh, misinformation and the importance of it in social media. Um, I think that part of it is that we are, that the, um, the defense against the disinformation is sort of democratizing, um, that we are all going to have to be responsible for combating disinformation and misinformation, um, that older Americans are susceptible for completely different reasons than Gen Z, for example, and young people. One is uh, sort of digital natives, digital citizens, et cetera. Um, and the other one, it's because of like their uh, lack of familiarity with the platforms and the ways that people can be duplicitous, et cetera. Um, and so, that there isn't some huge hack. Um, one, that two people underestimate how susceptible they are. Uh, so even like the most savvy of tech users um, can be sort of duped by disinformation. And so uh, it's, it's really anticlimactic when we talk about the tactics that we use, right? Checking the date, checking the source, et cetera. Um, but, uh, it is how we are going to have to compete. Uh, there are others who would say that, you know, in a marketplace of ideas that um, credible actors will rise to the top just because of market forces. And that's just not the case. Like the, there's so many ways for people to um, uh, manipulate their uh, impact, like manipulate the audience. Uh, and so, yeah, it is, it's going to be, um, all of our jobs, it's all of our responsibilities to combat misinformation and disinformation in that way. Um, I think that, um, oh, and it becomes a bigger deal and will become a much more bigger deal as we move forward because, uh, you know, our research also shows that 70% um, of young people got their information about elections from social media. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is that is a significant, that is a healthy majority. Um, and so thinking campaigns, um, but also, um, you know, operatives and, and, and analysts and pundits uh, thinking about, you know, social media as not a an afterthought, um, but like the battleground, like as the site of the conflict and also the site of the interventions. And, um, you know, it's not cute to be like, I don't tweet <laughs> or like, mm -hmm. what, is the, what is the TikTok? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, because these are, um, again, these new battlegrounds for people's hearts and minds and attention um, and where our democracy is being attacked um, and where we can save it and protect it. So well said. And well, Janet, I mean, you've given your life to accurate reporting and truth and getting the word out. You've seen this impact in campaigns. How do you react to what Ensley just said in terms of her experience and what happened in Georgia? Well, I, I just think that the risk and, and the, the challenge posed by this is kind of horrifying. I mean, it's terrifying. Um, I mean, I've given my life to, you know, mainstream media legacy news organizations that you know, have been thoroughly discredited, but I gotta say that the process of writing for a major newspaper subjects you to standards of, of proof and evidence that is not to be laughed at. And um, so the one thing about people saying, you know, so I find myself as a reporter, like back in the day when I could go out and meet people randomly on the campaign trail, I would, you know, you know hear stuff from people that was kind of clearly um, not true. And I would say, gee, where did you hear that? And the answer was often, oh, on Facebook or Fox News or, um, and 
uh, the, the kind of echo chamber quality of the news, uh, the information spread right now is really pretty horrifying. Um, and I, I totally agree with what Ensei was saying though, that, that it is kind of, it, it is our responsibility. I mean, I think part of political reporting now is reporting on misinformation, just mm -hmm. so people know that this is how it's spread. Like here is, here is a, um, a campaign that's targeted specifically on spreading misinformation to Latino voters, just to kind of get people aware that, that this stuff goes on. Um, you know, there's a, a nice nonprofit that was founded by uh, a former colleague of mine at the uh, LA Times called the News Literacy Project. Yeah. And what they do is they go into schools, mostly high schools, to, to talk to students about how to tell the difference between um, misinformation and, and, and accurate information. And I've always thought that, that I'm glad that, that they're focusing on students, but man, the whole country could use a news literacy project. Right, right. Bill, having uh, been in the political process and kind of seeing the party, Republican Party, now as you reference in this this moment, how do you react to the kind of the point of social media and where does this inform this dis the broad, not just social media, the disinformation, no matter what stream of news uh, that people are accessing it. So I think the question of social media and and disinformation more broadly, or mis and misinformation and the character of the Republican Party are very much connected in, in this way. I mean, I, I've been part of that we all have, I'm sure, discussions, formal and even and, and, and informal about social media and the strengths and weaknesses and what might be done in a regulatory way or self-regulation and citizen education. But it would be one thing if we had social media that was a little chaotic, a little crazy, kind of a lot of disinformation of all kinds floating around, rumors, you know, being exaggerated, people, you know, jumping to conclusions, but it was sort of haphazard, right? That would sort of be like a normal, chaotic, not optimal, but livable situation. And it would be like a lot of actually what life was probably like in the past too, except the rumors were not instantaneous and they were, you know, but they, they could linger and they could do damage, obviously. But that's, it's different if you have the characteristics of social media combined with a president for four years and a party that went along with him and, and enabled him, who really systematically set out, I think, to use the characteristics of social media in particular to push certain uh, views, but not just views, but actual lies, and then culminating in the big lie after November 3rd. I think that's a very different kind of threat, actually. One is kind of a low-grade fever that, you know, you sort of have, you can make it through probably as a political system. The other is sort of a really uh, purposeful attempt to uh, uh, destroy almost uh, the, the, the concept of truth and the standards of truth, and then to, to really weaponize, as it were, a whole bunch of social media for your own part, not just your partisan aims, but in this case, the aim of overturning an election. So I think that's actually related. And I think thinking through, therefore, the future of the parties has to be part of, which has to be thinking through, well, how do, they, how do parties work in an era of social media? What about the nominating process? What about all kinds of things, you know, that have changed a lot. So you can't just hope for the good old days, which weren't so great anyway. And uh, it really is a moment for fresh thinking of all kinds. And one reason that we've all discussed this, the fellow, is that I'm looking forward to being there, uh, being in the study group and talking to students uh, in the group and outside is, I mean, it is a good moment for fresh, fresh eyes, which presumably 20 year olds have more than I do, uh, to look at the situation and say, is this a reasonable way to kind of govern ourselves? And what can we do, do about this? And uh, because I do think it's the challenges, the combination of the uh, political challenges, the socioeconomic challenges, the media challenges, cultural challenges of the, of the day are really, it's, it's unusual. You know, most of the time in American politics, things are kind of changing incrementally. You can kind of build on what happened in the past. And obviously all that's still the case somewhat, but it is also, uh, I think in many ways, a, a new moment and it requires new thinking. Can well, I we add want... one more thing, Mark? Please, I, please. I, I promise to be brief, but no, go um, right ahead, please. Yeah, Janet and Bill both have inspired something in me, and just thinking about um, disinformation, like hot wars, you know, wars and conflicts that act that require like actual bloodshed are expensive, mm 
uh, and again, require bloodshed and thinking about um, disinformation and and um, and 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 demoralization and leveraging crisis to have people question our institutions and um, you know. For, participation in our democracy and and again these norms that we've agreed to um, that they have destabilized entire governments and so of course they can work uh, in a presidential election uh, a governor's race uh, and so thinking about how we respond how civil society responds and how we protect ourselves and our institutions is actually really really important um, in this moment can I, can I just add one last thing? Please. Um, you know, I was really struck by what Bill said in it, about how we're used to kind of incremental change in our political system. I mean, this really is a moment where things over the last four years, over the last month even, have just changed so dramatically. I mean, it's kind of like every step of the way you look around and things are look completely differently. And, you know, things like um, Democrats winning two runoff elections in Georgia. Who knew? Um, so I just think that that's why this is a really, um, while it's a perilous and scary moment in American politics, it is like totally fascinating. I mean, it, there's just so much going on and I, I really am looking forward to, uh, to, to sharing thoughts and ideas with uh, the students in my study group. Terrific. Well, we, we're going to go out to student questions, but Jana, while we have you, any news of the day? Anything that's happened since we've been on? The, uh, on the I don't know. I haven't. I haven't gotten any news flashes yet. Uh, the, what What you're asking about, Mark, is that the House Republican Conference has been meeting behind closed doors for several hours now to determine the fate of Liz Cheney, who was one of the ten Republicans to vote to impeach Trump. She was very outspoken in in a prepared statement, and there are many. Republicans that are wanting her to, to pay a political price for that. And they're deciding her fate right now. I, I don't have any any news on that. How about you, Bill? Do you see anything? Bill, any, any flash news reports? I don't, I don't know anything more than what we got on 40 minutes ago. So, All right. Well, let's go to our first question. If you could please um, turn your video on and introduce yourself. And uh, we're delighted to have you here. Hi, uh, my name is Ajay Sarma. Um, I'm a sophomore at Harvard College, um, and I'm calling in today from St. John's, Florida. Um, I just wanted to thank all of you for being here and for such an engaging forum thus far. It's been really interesting to hear all of your perspectives. Um, my question uh, tonight is for um, Ense, um, not just as someone interested in politics, but also as an admiring Floridian to the South <laughs> watching um, politics and everything unfolding in Georgia, um, not not in least part thanks to thanks to your hard work. Um, and my question is: in in 2018, during the um, midterm elections, I think both Georgia and Florida sort of saw um, a, a surge in, I guess, for lack of a better word, the the progressive spirit. Um, especially because of gubernatorial candidates that inspired people across the board, um, such as Andrew Gillum. Um, and yeah, but when we got to the 2020 general election, um, I think it became very clear that um, Georgians managed to sustain that movement, that sort of progressive upwelling, whereas it, it sort of seemed to peter out a bit in Florida. Um, despite Florida traditionally being considered the, the swing state between, between the two. So I guess my question to you is maybe twofold. One, why do you think that is? Where do you think that sort of um, point of departure was uh, between Florida and Georgia? And also, what do you think Floridians interested in maybe replicating the success of, of um, voter outreach movements and also progressive movements in Georgia, what do you think that we can do uh, to sort of um, reignite that spark? Right. So that's a very meaty question. Mm -hmm. Each of the, like each part of that question could be its own book, uh, its own class, uh, but I'll, I'll try to tackle them. One, we are looking at how much money was spent. Um, two, Florida is an enormous state, easily like six states in one. Um, I think three, um, 
the narrative in how Florida was lost and how Georgia was lost in 2018 is very different. And I think how civil society, community organizations, the parties responded um, is quite telling. So, you know, you think about 2018 and Stacey Abrams' non-concession, right? And the idea that I acknowledge that there are not enough votes for me to be considered the winner, but I do not concede because this process was, you know, fraudulent, et cetera. And so laying out all of the ways in which, you know, the 11 hour lines that people had to wait in the line, that, you know, Jesse Jackson showing up to the polling location because we were livid that there were, you know, one machine for a polling location that you know, 13,000 voters are supposed to vote at, et cetera, et cetera. The purges, you know, nearly a million people purged, 750,000 people purged from the voter rolls, et cetera. And so the organizing that happened in the days after, or in the years after the 2018 midterms to make sure that that never happened again that we would have essentially uh, the same partisan makeup in the state. And so how, you know, what are the interventions that need to be made? What are the, what's the organizing that needs to happen? What's the infrastructure that needs to be built so that what happened in Georgia in 2018 never happens again, again, versus the narrative about why Florida was lost. Um, and again, how the party responded uh, and how community organizations and civic organizations and civil society responded after 2018, leading up to 2020, I think matters. Again, again it also comes, um, at, we learn as baby organizers to follow the money. Um, and so I also think that an extraordinary investment um, was made uh, in Florida on the part of the Trump campaign um, because at once the Trump won Florida and they passed a $15 minimum wage, right? <laughs> and so like on the same ballot. Um, and so thinking about there's an appetite for progressive policy uh, in the state. Um, but I, I think is uh, the narratives that we tell ourselves about why a state was won and lost and how people respond in re reaction to that, I think is telling. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, I see Ryan is here. Ryan, please uh, introduce yourself and pose the question. Hey, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for speaking to us tonight. And thank you very much, Mr. Guerin. Uh, you were asking for a news update, and I just got a flash on my phone that the House passed the bu budget resolution uh, to allow the COVID-19 stimulus uh, package to pass with a simple majority. So that's that's the news update for tonight. Uh, my question is for you, Mr. Correspondent Tierney, for delivering our news <laughs> update. Uh, my, my question is for you, Mr. Crystal, uh, about uh, the future of the Republican Party. Uh, you've talked about, you've been kind of debating whether or not the Republican Party has a future. Uh, and I think one of the very important parts for the future of a party is having an engaged youth. Uh, now, in the Republican Party, uh, for the newer House members and the newer senators, they seem to be pretty problematic, uh, as, as we've seen over the past couple of weeks uh, with uh, the distribution of conspiracy theories and everything. Are there any Republicans that you see, uh, like newer Republicans that give you hope uh, for perhaps being able to mend the party uh, divisions and, and bring the Republican Party uh, out, of this, out of this Trump era? I mean, I have my own favorites, including some younger members. Uh, um, Jeremy Herrera Butler, is, I know, she's 39, 40, uh, uh, from, well, con Congresswoman from Washington State. And... Uh, John Katko. I mean, several of the people who voted for impeachment are not uh, particularly old, and uh, I, I think the Republican Party needs new blood. I, I've been one of those trying to recruit some people to run in the past. 2018 and 2020 were tough years to recruit uh, new people to come into politics on the Republican side, because you either had to be a Trump loyalist, and the people I was talking to at least didn't much want that, or you would have to run a, in a Republican primary against someone who would be a Trump loyalist and who would attack you for not being a Trump loyalist. And that's been very difficult. So maybe with Trump on the sidelines, we'll get some uh, fresh crop, so to speak, of people I've not talked to already just in the last three weeks, two different people thinking to both 9-11 vets, so, you know, 35 year old people who served sometimes since 9-11, thinking of running uh, in one case, likely for an open seat, in another case, perhaps primarying one of uh, Trump's loyalists. 
um, on the Republican side. So I think there's a little bit of an appetite for, gee, you know, I'm kind of pro-free market and I'm, I don't like some of the Democrat, Democratic policies, but is it possible to run as a Republican? But a lot, you know, a lot we determine what determined on that respect by what happens over the next year, obviously. And what will it look like when you have to decide in late this year to run or not to run? And is it just a fool's errand? And also, do you even want to be part of the party? I mean, usually if you're part of a party, even if you don't like other parts of it, let's think of Bernie Sanders, AOC, they do support the, the candidate of that party, right? They supported Biden. They work in the conference. They mostly vote with the party on the, the, the vote you just mentioned. That there are things they would change in, in, in the budget, but they voted for the budget resolution. I do think, and I say this personally true, too. I mean, do you really even, if the party goes further in the direction it's been going or stays in that direction or doesn't repudiate in some ways aspects of the Trump years, do, do people want to be part of that party? So I think it's a play more of almost an existential crisis, you know, than the normal, gee, they're kind of, uh, you know, tilting to the old side and uh, and they're not getting, doing a very good job of outreach. That was sort of the standard criticism, which was true in large measure of the Republican party, you know, seven, eight, 10 years ago. I think we're beyond that. I would say one last thing about young voters and and say probably knows this data better than I do. They did vote more, they are more progressive in their views. They voted more democratic. The margins weren't quite as great, I think, as people expected, actually. Um, and, you know, it's not as if Matt Gates uh, or, for that matter, Marjorie uh, uh, Taylor Greene are elderly members. They're not baby boomers who don't know, know how to use social media and have been taken in by something they don't understand. Some of the most aggressive Trump supporters and conspiracy theorists, frankly, and people willing to dabble in, I think, pretty reprehensible views, are quite young. <laughs> and so that raises interesting questions too about, you know, makes me more worried, honestly, about the future. If, if you could tell me that, look, this is all gonna pass. These are a bunch of people who had, maybe they've had a rough time, maybe you don't wanna blame them for it, but whatever, they're disgruntled, but you know, they're kind of the passing generation and we can have great confidence in all the young people. But I look at some of the young members of the House Republican Conference, the senators, who is, isn't Hawley the youngest, is he the youngest senator, I think? And, and uh, Tom Cotton and Ted Cruz, they're, those are three extremely well-educated, uh, I guess they all have Harvard connections, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe not all of them, but um, uh, young Republican senators. And from my point of view, that's not a very good future for the Republican Party. And that's just my view. Maybe other people could differ. So there isn't an automatic correlation between, gee, if we just get more you know, young people in or get them better educated or even get them from more diverse backgrounds necessarily, uh, that, that it ends up being more the kind of party at least that I would like. So these things are complicated, some of these social economic trends and cross-cutting uh, aspects to those trends. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, next up from Georgia, our first year rep who is very involved with Harvard Votes Challenge. And then welcome yeah, with your you. question. Thank you all so much for um, for coming. Uh, my name is Amen, like uh, Mark said, I'm a first year at the college um, and I've learned so much from this discussion already and I can't wait to see what all of you do as fellows. Um, but I'm currently calling in from Atlanta, Georgia where I was born and raised. So um, I had the privilege of really getting to engage with this past January Senate runoffs and witness firsthand the change um, that's being wrought in our state. It was definitely incredibly surreal to kind of see the national focus shift to Georgia. Um, but in a state like mine, much of my community has always been, especially recently, um, equally distributed across party lines. Um, so bipartisanship has been um, particularly important to me throughout um, my uh, my life and, 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 and interest in politics. And I just wanted to ask this of all of you, but how do you think journalism, organizing, and, and liberal democratic principles, um, especially in the context of bipartisanship, interacted to bring about the outcome we saw in Georgia this past January? Um, so often we tend to, I feel, compartmentalize the ways in which we can engage civically. And I'd love to hear about your experiences with the interdisciplinary support of democratic efficacy and, and partisan cooperation and how we can replicate it beyond Georgia throughout the country. Great question. Janet or Ensei, who wants to start? Well, you know, one thing that I thought was really interesting about uh, the Georgia race was exactly what you pointed out is that there was so much attention on this one race, um, national attention, national money, even as the the you know the local political um, dynamics were were very in you know very locally grown, so it wasn't like this was the case of of a of an important race that became nationalized and kind of distorted that way. 
But the national attention was really intense, probably Ensei knows better than anybody. Um, and it was almost like it gave the, the entire country like a civics le lesson in, um, on like political engagement, um, how, how grassroots organizing can change things, how um, a national leader like Donald Trump could really um, spoil an election for his own party. Um, I also think it gave us a, a good like inside uh, look under the hood of how votes are counted and tabulated. We got to watch three recounts in Georgia. Um, and I do think that, that there is this way in which that, that that's the whole Trump era has been a little bit of a civics lesson for us because who knew how impeachment worked until he got impeached twice. Um, so I just think that, that maybe something like Georgia's uh, runoff election inspires uh, activists on both sides, both parties to do things differently be just because the outcome was so closely followed and um, historically surprising. It just showed that things are changing in Georgia and it's got a lot of people thinking about what's going on there. Um, Democrats thinking, how can we do this in North Carolina? Republicans saying, how do we keep it from happening in North Carolina or um, Florida or, um, Anyway, yep. those are yep. my thoughts. And say, so you must have some thoughts on this. I do. Um, I would say, yeah, uh, the Georgia election um, does provide some examples and opportunities for us to think about how we engage civil society. Um, I think about the opportunities or the sort of the, the introduction um, to the rest of the country of the evangelical left. I think that oftentimes people think about um, evangelicals as right leaning um, and with the, you know, with Warnock's candidacy, uh, you know, people got an introduction to, you know, liberation theology um, and uh, like hardcore believers, uh, the sort of multi-faith work um, that was happening across the South. Again, uh, community organizations um, and their role. Um, I think about just the extraordinary amount of money uh, that was spent. I, I mean, I imagine that there will be other uh, conversations about this as well, but, you know, it's almost a billion dollars in nine weeks is a lot of money, y'all. Um, and so what that means, oh, and, and nationalization and the nationalization of the race. And like, that used to be verboten, right? That the idea was the nationalization of a race is, you know, meant why things went really, really wrong and why it went bad for a particular candidate. And so I would argue that the impact um, of the elections, like part of the narrative for some of the campaigns was talking about what um, a Warnock and Ossoff victory meant for the balance of power in the United States Senate, which is not just a Georgia conversation. Uh, it's a national conversation, which is why many people around the country were invested in the outcomes. I think about um, uh, how, you know, our Secretary of State became famous. Uh, and like, and not only that, but the Secretary of State, what he does, uh, his staff, right, the people who hold press conferences for him, um, also got famous. So, to your point, Janet, the sort of the the civics lesson, the nitty gritty of how elections um, are won. I think about voter suppression and how. Um, up to leading up to this election, I, I imagine that it conjured images of, you know, Bubba on the back of a pickup truck trying to intimidate Black voters. And now folks really got intimately familiar with voter purges uh, and some of the race neutral ways in which, um, you know, uh, hurdles are constructed or erected uh, that makes it that make it difficult for people to vote. And so um, there is no part of society uh, in Georgia that did not get tapped, that did not get engaged, that did not in some way, I mean, thinking about Africans, um, and you mentioned the sort of bipartisan nature of your community. Um, I would argue that there's a that, that there's a narrative about the the leaders uh, in the community, so faith leaders 
and business leaders being all along the ideological spectrum, but then digging deep and beyond that and bringing people who never talked about politics and public um, and thinking that, you know, we need to actually know more about um, naturalized citizens and new Americans and where they fall along the ideological spectrum, because there are a lot, of, I think that much of what is considered um, uh, conventional wisdom uh, is actually rooted in assumptions and very little data. So I just have one word. I mean, so I think January 5th and January 6th, the Georgia runoff plus the, what happened the next day in the Capitol could end up being a, twinned in the history books as a very significant inflection point uh, in our in our in our history, really. And so I, I think it's right to focus on it. And I think if you I, if Republicans like me were rooting for the Democrats and helping the Democrats a little bit in that race on the fifth, not just the progressives. Having said that, we should just to be slightly, you know, cut the cut the other way and be uh, as is appropriate in an academic discussion. I mean, after two months of the, what I regard as the most disgraceful behavior by a president in modern times, in terms of casting doubt on our democracy and damaging our democracy, endorsed by both Republican candidates in Georgia, neither of whom incidentally was a very strong candidate, one of whom had won one race, Purdue, the other had been appointed and had never won a race, Leffler, both of whom had corruption charges, they got 48 and 49% of the vote. So we shouldn't be sitting around honestly saying, well, you know, that really proves that it's just, uh, everything's fine in American democracy. And, you know, you get punished if you do the wrong thing. The truth is it was a very close, pretty closely run thing. If Georgia didn't have a runoff, incidentally, Ossoff doesn't win the first uh, the first round against Purdue. So, uh, you know, and the runoff ironically is, was put in years ago for bad reasons, right? For kind of, <laughs> to preserve white supremacy, basically. Um, so I believe. So um, anyway, just a long way of saying that, I, I you know, with this, the country is pretty evenly divided. You know, it's not quite evenly divided. Biden got, what, 7 million more votes than Trump. But it, uh, and the people respond to different things in different ways. And so I do very much agree in a way that the, the task ahead is not, uh, you know, is, is very large. I'm not making a partisan point here, but I just think in terms of civic education, political engagement, uh, education of people about our constitutional system and so forth, uh, the amount of pressure that Raffensperger got, incidentally, is really astonishing. And he didn't get a lot. And his own you know, governor barely supported him. His own senators attacked him. I mean, the, the, it was lucky that a few of these people stood up to Trump and you could have had a very different situation over those two months. So uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, it was, a, it was all a kind of a close run thing, I would say, both the fifth and the sixth, if you want to think of it this way, right? The sixth could have been incredibly much worse in terms of death and destruction and the outcome there. And the fifth could have gone differently. So on the one hand, these two dates are kind of significant. On the other hand, they're also uh, warning uh, uh, bells, I would say. Yep, interesting pairing. Well, Scott, we are nearing the hour, but let's get you in for a, for a question. Thank you, Alman. Yes, thank you all for having me on. Uh, my name is Scott Wright. I'm a sophomore from Nebraska studying government, and I'm actually the director of outreach for the Fellows and Study Groups program, so I'm looking forward to getting to work with you all this semester. My question is mostly for Janet, but also for the rest of you if you have insight. Trump's media sphere and his celebrity were often enabled by certain actors and agencies and behaviors within the media. Um, as we try to move forward, what do you think needs to happen differently? And what do you think needs to change in the way reporters go about their jobs to re-strengthen the importance of truth and combat disinformation like the big lie? And what advice do you all have for people who are looking to do communications and or journalism in a post-Trump world? Well, Scott, that, you're kind of circling us back to the what we were talking about before in terms of how do you combat disinformation. Um, I know there's there's been a, a, a sense that somehow the media enabled Trump's rise by paying attention to him when he was running in 2015 by you know airing his his rallies. I mean, you could say that 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 was that could have been the thing that would bring him down if if you kind of give a lot of attention to a crazy man, the world sees he's a crazy man. Um, so I I don't know about the how much I mean by the end of his term, I thought I thought that the media was totally laser like focused on the amount of disinformation that he was he was purveying. I, I mean, 
a lot of journalistic norms broke down. Like for the longest time, journalists were reluctant to refer to uh, anybody as lying. And it was, the idea was that you impute a motive to somebody when you say that they've lied. And um, media organizations all over the place were, had dropped that and, and were, tr so that, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not, kind of offering an apology for anything that, that the media did to, to enable Trump. But I do think that, that it's such a large problem, this business of combating misinformation. And I do think that responsible news organizations are more part of the solution than part of the problem. That's great. Thank you, Scott. Great question. I, I get the sense we could be here for another whole hour, but in deference to everyone's time. I should probably call it there. Tomorrow night, we we'll welcome back our three other fellows, Governor Bullock and Mayor Tubbs and Bonnie Glick. Um, on Friday, we welcome the First Minister of Singapore. And next week, uh, Robert Putnam with his co-author, Shailen uh, Romney Garrett, will be with us in conversation with Jonathan Capehart on their new book, Upswing. So please go to our website, go to the website for the various study groups of our fellows. I thank NSA and Janet and Bill for a really rich and interesting conversation this evening. And everyone stay safe and be well and join us back tomorrow evening at six o'clock for our next three fellows. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks.